I was going to share these five points. And then I said, but I really need to share this. I can't share this without showing you the full story. Because it's really easy once we read our text verse to become very judgmental. I mean, we know Israel, right? Their whole lives have been this. Good kings, bad kings, they did right, they ran, they worshiped God, they worshiped idols. That's, that's what their whole New Old Testament story is. Israel, and I used to think, how could they? They seen God, experienced God. In the tabernacle, they seen uh, the wonderful fire and the cloud. They seen it all. And yet they still would walk away. And deny God. Peter, after a three-year ministry, said, I don't know the man. He swore with an oath, I don't know that man. After Jesus had just told him, before the cock crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. He said, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. Be careful. All right, let's stand to our feet if you would, please. Jeremiah 42, verse number 1. Then all the captain of the forces, and Johanna the son of Korea, and Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near. And we're going to figure out who these people are and why they came together. And this people, okay, and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee. Now watch this. And pray for us unto the Lord thy God. Notice the words they told Jeremiah, your God. Now I want you to remember that. Even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us. That the Lord, again, look at the words, thy God, Jeremiah's God, may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God. Now whose God is it? According to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing that the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, between what we've said and what you've said. Now watch. They basically have now committed themselves to doing what Jeremiah is going to give them. They said, if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us, watch this, when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. That's a wonderful introduction. Don't look like there's any situational problems with Jeremiah. We're sending you to God. You're God's man. You're God's prophet. And we're in a place in our life we need to hear from God. And here's what they said. No matter what God says, whether it's good or bad, we will do it. Wherever he sends, we'll take care of it. Whatever he wants, we'll yield, we'll be obedient. That sounds really wonderful. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father. Thank you today in the name of our precious Lord for the goodness of Almighty God. Lord, we've come before you this morning with much prayer and supplication. 
We've literally opened up our hearts and said, God, meet with us. Help us. Stir in our hearts. Help us to be a people that will literally yield our lives as examples of Christianity. We want people to see Christ in us, Christ through us, and Christ for us. And oh God, I pray that the light of the gospel will burn so bright in our hearts. And it will if we yield ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. So bless now this moment. I pray you'd prepare our hearts and help me. Oh God, help me to say exactly what needs to be said in this moment. Bless our time together and we'll thank you in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen and amen. Thank you for your standing. Our title again is Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow Question Mark. Now the portion that I just read, verses 1 through 6, out of Jeremiah 42, was the statement made very plain. They said, go to God on our behalf, and when you come back with God's answer, consider it done. Whatever God tells you to tell us, it's a done deal. And I believe with all my heart they meant it. Just like today when we say, God, if you'll help me in this situation, I'll serve you all the days of my life. And we mean it. But then things happen in life because the enemy has heard your vow. He's heard your commitment. He's heard your promises. And he'd like nothing else than to make a liar out of you. That's his business. He is the deceiver of the brethren. He's the liar and the father of them. So don't get mad at him if he's busy doing his job get mad at yourself if he almost overcomes you so let's see how we can do this this morning the group of their people are on their way to Egypt and I guess the best way to help you see that back up one chapter 41 in verse 16 then to Johanna the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, I want you to remember that name because this whole story is about this man named Ishmael, whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mizpah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even mighty men of war, and the women, and the children, and the eunuchs, whom he had brought again from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitations of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem. Look at the statement, to go to enter into Egypt. They're in Judea, and while they're awaiting Judea, their minds are already made up. We're going to Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. We could sit here with God, but in Egypt, they have food, they have water. There's not war going on. There's a lot of great things, and we want to be a part of that. Even though God just delivered them, so basically their prayer to Jeremiah was, See if you can get God to convince us not to go to Egypt. Because that's where our heart says we need to go for our protection. The man, Gedaliah, has just been murdered. He was even warned that he was going to be murdered. Now, Nebuchadnezzar really loved Gedaliah and he made him the governor there in Judea. So everybody just loved Gedaliah. He was a man that just had God radiating over him. So all of a sudden, 
another king sent Ishmael to go and murder him. But so that you're not hindered in your murder prospect, go and be his friend. Go and eat bread with him. Go and make yourselves as one of the friends. You know, not all friends are the friends they supposed to be. So now, Israel, or the remnant that's left, are terrified of King Nebuchadnezzar because Ishmael just killed the governor. Back up to chapter 40. I want you to look at verse 16 of Jeremiah chapter 40. Uh, let's back up to verse 13. Moreover, Johanna, the son of Korea, and all the captain of the forces that we just read in 42.1 that were in the fields came to Gedaliah to Mizpah. Now watch what they said. It said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, hath sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee. But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, believed them not. Then Johanna, the son of Korea, spake to Gedaliah and Mizpah secretly, saying, Let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no man shall know it. I'll do it quietly and secretly. Wherefore should he slay thee, that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said unto Johanna, the son of Korea, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. He's my friend. He wouldn't do that to me. So now, after Gedaliah was murdered and all the people that were with him, and they were thrown into a pit which King Asa had made to hold water to protect the kingdom. So now if you look in chapter 41, let's look in verse 2. Then rose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and ten men, I want you to remember that, and ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. And Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, that was with Gedaliah, at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. Look at verse 5. Uh, that came, that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even four score men. That's 80 men having their beards shaven, their clothes rent, having cut themselves with offerings and incense of their hand to bring them unto the house of the Lord. These people are broken. They're weeping. The only thing we didn't hear is them taking ashes and putting it on their heads. Verse 6, And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went forth from Mizpah to meet them, the 80 men, weeping all along as he went. He prepared to be doing what the 80 men were doing, but he did it for a show as not to catch you surprised. Now watch this. And it came to pass as he met them, he said unto them, Come to get Eliah, the son of Ahikam. In other words, are you going to see the governor? Now watch this. And it was so that when they came to the midst of the city, that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, slew them. 
and cast them into the midst of the pit. He and the men that were with him. So ten helpers and Ishmael just tried to overtake Gedaliah, killed him. All the Jews that were with him killed them. And now he's out meeting this group of 80. And guess what he's fixing to do? Now, look in verse number 7. And it was so that when they came into the midst of the city, I want you to notice that Ishmael and his ten feathered right in the group and no one knew the difference. And cast him into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. But wait a minute. Not all 80 were caught, but 10 men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasures in the field, which is the treasures of wheat and of barley and of oil and of honey. So he forbear and slew them not among their brethren. Look down to verse 10. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters, Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, and all the people that remained in Mizpah, that's including Jeremiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, and Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites, which was the Jews' enemies. But when Johanna, the son of Korea, it's the people we read about in 42.1, when all the captain of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, then they got together, they took all the men, to went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. Now it came to pass when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanna, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces. Now those that were in captivity, they saw that who was with him, and they were glad. They said, he's coming to rescue us. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captivity from Mizpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanna the son of Korea. But Ishmael the son of Nethaniah escaped from Johanna. He ran from the battle with eight men. How many did we start with? Ten. So he's lost two men. Now watch this. Then we read at the beginning of our service today Verses 16, 17, and 18. Now you know why verse 17, it says at the end, to go and to enter into Egypt. They wanted to get away from Ishmael. They wanted to run from the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, because he is fixing to get wholly upset for Ishmael killing the governor. And now they're saying, we're running. You can stay and let God protect you, or you can run what seems to be peace and safety. Now, the Bible tells us when they cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Now we're in chapter 42, and as we start verse 42, this same group of people who were in captivity by Ishmael have been delivered by Johanna and his men. So now, here we are. We've been delivered. God has spared us. We didn't lose any more, and we killed at least two of uh, Ishmael's men. So now, our best intent as a group of Jews is to run to Egypt. Yes, we'll be slaves. But it seems to be the best choice that outwardly looks for us to do. So now we come to our text verse reading, and they said, whatever God wants us to do, but wait a minute, while I'm asking God's direction, I want you to know we're on our way to Egypt. But God says, no, I need you to stay here. Let me protect you. Let me be God, 
and trust me, follow me, believe in me. Now watch. Look at verse number 7 of chapter 42. The Bible said, now Jeremiah's already prayed this prayer, and I don't know why, but look how long it took to get a response. And it came to pass after 10 days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, finally. Now, Jeremiah's got a message to deliver. Then called he Johanna, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest. Remember, that's what we read in verse 1. Now watch. And said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplications before him. And here's the answers. If ye will still abide in the land, Judea, then will I build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. Now watch this. This is God saying, For I repented me of the evil that I've done unto you. Now listen to verse 11. This is where the tide changes. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon. No one told God in the prayer, we're running to Egypt because we're terrified of King Nebuchadnezzar. We knew what a tyrant he was. So Jeremiah said, God said, Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. Watch this. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. I've come to protect you. And I will show mercies unto you that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. Now, let's finish the request. But if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God. Have you thought why Jeremiah has given them a solution of both? If you stay, you're going to be protected. If you go, watch this. He said, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God. Remember what we just read in verses 1 through 6. They said, whatever God says, it's a done deal. Nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread. There will we dwell. Now, this is not the people talking. This is still Jeremiah giving them the other side of the equation. And now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Look at the next two words. If ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, let me stop. It's going to be detrimental if you continue this journey. It's going to be so bad, I'm trying my best to convince you, stay put. Stay where I have put you and wait on me to provide and protect you. Because I know why you're running to Egypt. You're terrified of the king. But I'm bigger than the king. I can take care of every single one. Now, verse 16 then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared, running from King Nebuchadnezzar, shall overtake you there, where? In the land of Egypt. And the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there shall ye die. So shall it be with all the men that set their faces to go into Egypt to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the evil. Now watch this, that I will bring 
upon them. You don't have to worry about King Nebuchadnezzar. You better worry about me. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you when you shall enter into Egypt, and ye shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach, and ye shall see this place no more. The Lord hath said concerning, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. Now everybody look up here. The group that was left and was not killed, was not thrown into the pit, have been delivered by one of the men of war, a leader, so to speak, a captain. And he literally was after Ishmael to kill him. He escaped, and I guess either they captured or killed two of his ten men. So now that they've been delivered by the hand of God, their fear of King Nebuchadnezzar said, we know what's taking place in Egypt, and that's where we've got to go. There's no war. There's no trumpet blast. There's plenty of food, plenty of water. I mean, they know what it was back in Moses' day when they came out of Egypt. And for over 400 years, they were slaves under their taskmasters. So they're well knowledgeable about the past. But fear. But fear. Look at verse 11 again. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Now, this is God saying, I know what you're doing. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you out of his hand. Now, if God told you that, whom shall we fear? They've got God protection. So before we finish, let me give you this little short outline. In verses 1 and 2, you see the people, which was the remnant. It was a great class of people because it was Jews that were really going through such tremendous times that God was punishing them and then saving them. And the cry of the people was, Jeremiah... Go ask God what he wants us to do, and whatever God says, we'll do it. No questions asked. So they came, they cared, and their cause was finding the will of God. What does God want us to do? Because we are about to head to Egypt, but what does God want us to do? Well, verse 11 was quite plain. I mean, you don't have to be a theologian to understand God said don't go because if you do go everything you feared from King Nebuchadnezzar I'm going to bring upon you so now how does the choice look go to Egypt well we're going to die fear of King Nebuchadnezzar well he could kill us but God said I'll protect you so if God's protecting you King Nebuchadnezzar can't do anything to us so it shouldn't be that hard. So we see the people, and then we see the prophet in verse 2. Jeremiah, which was also one of the one that was in captivity. But they knew enough about this prophet that he could get in touch with God. He was called the weeping prophet for a, a reason. We see his title as Jeremiah the prophet. We see this testimony that he could get in touch with God. And we see his task, he interceded for the people of God. And then we see their petition. Verse 3, they said, go find out what does God want us to do. So they said, tell us the way, tell us the walk, and when we find that out, we will willingly 
follow his lead. That's the petition. What do you want us to do? Now, is that something we almost do every day? God, what would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? Where would you have me to work? Do you want me to buy this car? Do you want me to buy this house? We ask God about everything. In verse 4, you see the promise. Jeremiah promised to pray, and he did. And he poured out his heart and said, for the remnant that's here, they want to know what do you want them to do, and we will wait for your answer. So Jeremiah promised to pray. He also promised to preach, and he said, what I hear, I will proclaim to you. I'll give you word for word what God said. And then Jeremiah promised that he would prepare them. He's going to lean for them to do the best decision. He's going to say it's really better to follow God than to fear King Nebuchadnezzar. And then in verse 5 and 6, there's the pledge. They made a vow. I believe it says something like this. Then they said to Jeremiah, verse 5 of chapter 42, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all the things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whatever he tells you to tell us, it's a done deal. Don't that sound pretty easy and reasonable? The pledge is not only making a vow, it's keeping a vow. God even tells us it's better for us not to pledge a vow than to pledge it and not keep it. God says it's very dangerous to promise me something and you don't hold up your end. He prayed and an answer came. Verse number 7, I read it to you early and it came to pass. After 10 days, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, gather the people together. I've got an answer from God. It took 10 days, but you're going to like this. Because the word that God has given me is going to be so easy for you to understand that even your children can comprehend. So Jeremiah begins to give them verses 10 on through verse 15. And he told them, don't be afraid. Fear causes many strange things to happen in our lives. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the uncertain. Fear of tomorrow, fear of when we're going to die, fear of how we're going to die, we fear. He prayed, an answer came, and it found out that the only reason for Egypt was the terror that King Nebuchadnezzar had put in their hearts. But wait a minute, God said, and I'm going to paraphrase, God said he'll have to go through me first. He's not going to touch a hair on your head. I will take care of you. Now, this is not Jeremiah talking. This is the God in whom they serve said, don't worry about it. I know you're afraid, but trust me. Please, this once, trust me. I'll take care of you. And if that's not good enough, if you go to Egypt, you're going to die. Can I make it any more plainer? He prayed, he got an answer, he preached, verse 13 through 18, he gave them everything and every clear, understandable choice. And then look in verse 19, he predicted their outcome. The Lord hath said concerning you, O remnant of Judah, if you didn't get it by now, Go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. Jeremiah said, you heard what God said. For ye disassemble in your hearts when you sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God will say, shall say, so declared unto us, and he's mocking them, and you said we will do it. 
And now Jeremiah said, And I have this day declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed. Now wait a minute, Jeremiah. They've, they've not gone to Israel yet, but notice what he says. But ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. So as Jeremiah is declaring the message, he's seeing probably things like, we're out of here. I mean, you believe what he's telling us? So Jeremiah is already seeing, you're already deciding to go to Egypt no matter what I've said. Verse 21. And now I have this day declared it unto you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. Now therefore, know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, and in the place where ye desire to go and to sojourn. Now, know surely that he has provoked them to stay. You will die if you don't stay. Chapter 43. And I'm actually done. And it came to pass, verse 1, that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people of the words, of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them even all these words. Then spake Azariah the son of Hosea, and Johanna the son of Korea, and all the, look at the word, proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, see if your Bible says this, thou speakest falsely, you're a liar. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. That's you. He didn't say that. Wait a minute. Let's back up one chapter. Whatever God says, we will do. Wherever he sends, I will, I will follow. Question mark. Look at verse 4. So Johanna, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces, and all the people, and how did Jeremiah know? Obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. Verse 7. So they came into the land of... You mean you went anyway? Are you kidding me? For they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus came they even to Tephanes, just outside of the city of Egypt. So the reason for the title is, where he leads me, I will follow, maybe. It depends. If it's within my liking. So when we ask God, whatever you have for me, I'll follow. Maybe. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Maybe. Where you send, I will follow. Mm, maybe. Do you realize a whole chapter was given to this group to save their lives? I mean, how, how much easier can it get? If you stay, you'll live. If you go, you'll die. Now, it doesn't take rocket science to go, let's see, go there, we die, stay here, we live. Let me, let me see. Jeremiah did his job. He prayed, he interceded, and he delivered. But what he delivered didn't tickle the ears. It didn't tickle their fancy. It didn't give them what they were wanting. They looked into Egypt and, yep, that's what we want right there. What they offer, Egypt is a type of the world. When the children of God look at the world with more excitement, 
than the things and the blazes of God, there's problems. And there's tremendous repercussions. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, please. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, we come before you again asking, oh God, would you send grace and mercy to help us. And Lord, wouldn't we pray and say, Lord, whatever you have us do in our hearts, we're honest. And sometimes things of this life, people, friends, family, situations, and fear, it can cause us to look twice at something else over God's perfect will. How can we miss it? When you've literally laid out a plan that's foolproof, stay and live, go and die. And everything you fear here, I'm going to make sure it takes care of you and it will take your life over there. Because you didn't stay and trust me. You didn't stay and follow me. You didn't stay and believe in me. I'll make an example of you that others will hear and understand what I've warned you about and what you still went ahead and did. So the song in our songbook says, wherever you lead, I'll follow. Whatever you want, I will do my level best to listen to you, follow you to be submissive, I hope. So, Father in heaven, I knew you knew their hearts because before they came to you with prayer, you already knew where their hearts were running to for their fear. You tried your best to change their minds. You warned them. You gave them all the aspects of a bad decision, and yet they still went on. And everything they feared followed them and came to pass. Father, when we pray, Lord, wherever you send, we'll go. Wherever you lead, we'll follow. I hope from Israel's example, we can have an example that turns out well because we know that this example was put in the Bible for us. It was to teach us. God hasn't changed. So, Father, help us here at Priceful Baptist Church that we'll be led of the Spirit of God. We'll go and do exactly as you have commanded. It's better to stay with God and struggle than to go in the ways of the world and die. So, Father, we give it to you. Speak to everyone here. If there's someone here that's never been saved, today is their day. It is God's will for every person to be born into the family of God. He has prepared a way and a place. He's done it all so you can come freely accepting his grace for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've never followed the Lord in baptism, well, we can take care of that as a church to immerse you biblically and to help you be submissive unto our Lord. And then if you're here looking for a church, we pray that God will direct you to help you find the place of worship where he can best use you. Help us, oh God, to be submissive, and we all thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.